everyone. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, so John and I wrote this book called Designing Across the Senses. It was published by O'Reilly about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, we're not allowed to tell you how you get your O'Reilly animal, so don't even ask. Um, while we were writing this book, uh, we kind of took a, a sort of wider perspective. We interviewed cognitive neuro neuroscientists, uh, perceptual and behavioral psychologists. Uh, we talked to optometrists who actually worked on products like Google Ga Glass, um, people who worked on a bunch of different products who were on the human and sort of uh, uh, a human side of the experience um, to find out how people were reacting to some of these new technologies. Um, and so uh, I just lost my remote one second, and then I'll start. The world is filled with information that can't be Googled. And we use it all the time. Our lives are predominantly physical experiences. They are how we collect information for rational observation and inquiry. They are how we perceive beauty, feel joy, and delight. They are how we communicate and connect with others. Through them, we express how we feel and who we are. The senses are integral to all human experience. Understanding them is key to creating great products. Sealed within the dark chamber of your skull, your brain has never experienced the external world, and it never will. Instead, there's only one way that information gets into the brain. Your sensory organs, your eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and skin act as interpreters. They detect a motley crew of information sources, including photons, air compression waves, like ultrasonic waves, molecular concentrations, pressure, texture, temperature, and translate them. Unlike Tank in the Matrix, most of us can't do much with falling lines of machine code. The gazillions of bits of information on the internet must be translated from ones and zeros into interfaces that we can physically experience. We can read text and view images, videos, and virtual worlds. We can hear alerts or speak requests to the latest assistance. We can feel the buzz of our phone in our back pockets or the victorious rumble of the game controller in our hands as we blow up the last boss on the last level. Everything we experience, whether physical, digital, natural, or designed, is through our senses. All human experiences start as sensory experiences, including multimodal product experiences. In this talk, I'd like to be able to answer three questions for you. The first is, what is multimodal design? Um, I found out that I, I, I didn't know what I thought it was, and I found out uh, that it was something different than I thought. What are the core design principles? and how are multimodal products created? But first, I have a question of you. How many of you are multimodal designers or engineers? Just show of hands. OK. Good question. So what is multimodal design? <laughs> Think of some multimodal products. We just saw one. We just saw a few, actually. <coughs> so there are whole new uh, product categories around multimodal, um, let alone products, right? Wearables, robotic surgery, um, 
portal, home assistant, gaming, VR, XR, you name it. There's just a whole bunch of new stuff out there and new ways to interact with the technology. So what is an interface mode? Um, simply put, it's a set of inputs and outputs in an interface channel. So for example, a mouse waits for your input, a click or a roll around. Um, it tries to figure out where it's being moved to. It tries to decide what you've done and what to do about it. And then it gives you an output. It will refresh your screen or uh, play a sound when you click something. Am I losing my remote again? I think I am. Ooh. Uh, in the so there have been a bunch of interface modes since the beginning of computing. Uh, we started out with a trackball, then there was the light pen by MIT. And you can see, uh, starting in the 1970s up until now, it's really exploded. There are so many different ways to be able to interact with technology. Uh, this is due to new device capabilities. On the analyze and decide part, there's cloud, uh, new forms of connectivity, uh, machine learning and AI, and on the inputs and output side, you have sensors and M's, microelectronic, oh, I can never say this right, microelectronical, microelectrical mechanical systems, basically the outputs, things like haptics, sound, et cetera. For example, in your iPhone, there's over a dozen sensors already, proximity, uh, several different kinds of cameras, capacitive touch, force resistance, the taptic engine, the accelerometer for, and gyroscope, um, GPS. Um, consumer electronics just have a wide ar array, array of ways to figure out what you're doing. Multimodal is pretty new for devices, but has been standard to humans for millions of years. To put it in perspective, a typical consumer device has tens of interface modes or multi-modes. A typical human has thousands of sensory, sensory motor modalities or multi-modalities and the ability to modify or, and existing or create new ones. Keep in mind, right now neuroscientists estimate that it will still take 30 years to build a replica of the human brain. We're that far out in terms of computing power uh, compared to what people can do. And 50% of our brain power is used for just understanding our senses alone. The human eyes can capture 10 million bits of information per second. We are pretty advanced in terms of the sensors that we come with. So to understand the difference between what a computer can do and what you can do, Let's test drive your own senses. So take a sensory inventory of where you are right now. Look, feel, smell, touch, and flex. This information will be used to answer some questions. I'll give you like 30 seconds. Look around, listen, it's a pop quiz. Sorry to stress you out. <laughs> All right, are you guys ready? <coughs> yes? All right. <coughs> How many items in the room are solid blue? Does your shirt smell like laundry detergent or fabric softener? <laughs> Sit up straight and relax your shoulders. Only half of you did that. Come on. <laughs> Do you feel better now? Yes, no? How many of you could answer any of those questions based on your initial inventory? 
Show of hands. Really? Okay, so that was like three people. Three, four. Did you notice the unicorn? How many people noticed the unicorn? <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing about our senses is that we filter most sensory information out because we don't need it. That's how our attention works. It tries to minimize cognitive load at all times. But when we are surprised, when something is unexpected, we notice right away and our senses get focused on them immediately. These are all sensory modalities, all of the different questions that I asked you. And when we use them together, they are multimodalities. So in comparison to a device mode, a human modality looks similar in a lot of ways. There's the sense, and then we use our brains to understand and decide, and then we can act on that information. And we use them in the same way, um, in channels. Modalities are referred to by their focal sense. Visual, auditory, haptic. Haptic is a combination of tactile and proprioceptive, as well as balance. Um, olfactory, which is smell, and gustatory, which is taste. And extend to additional senses. Proprioceptive and vi vestibular help us know how to move and where we are in space. And time and rhythm. Um, we asked a bunch of different people where this comes from. There's no specific place in the brain or there's no specific sensory organ for it, but somehow we can tell that time is passing. Um, uh, nobody's figured this out one yet, so uh, don't look at us. Uh, multimodalities are combinations of modalities. We form them around specific decisions or activities. Multimodal design starts by understanding how people use their senses together. Then different physical and digital modes can be layered together to support them. So as you're creating multimodal interfaces, you have to think about how a hu how human senses, um, decisions and actions, are paired against the way a device um, can read what we're doing or read our environment on our behalf. Um, there's also this thing called the ref reflex arc, where some of our perceptions will just completely bypass our brain and go immediately to action. Things like startle response, like when you jump, when you're surprised. And there are many different ways to map human modalities and interface modes together. So um, I think the, the way people most often think of, um, of interface modes is this way, in the user-controlled sense, where, for example, using a touch screen or using a mouse and keyboard, um, it's sort of one-to-one. -one. The device mode maps to the way the human is using the experience. But in ass assisted and augmented experiences, they're actually running in parallel. Um, and they're complementing each other. So the device and the human are responding with, uh, uh, to each other. And in automated and immersive experiences, um, the device will actually take over and try to monitor or respond or something else on behalf of the user. And then they become a singular mode sort of uh, brought together. The two most common inter, uh, human, human multimodalities are audio-visual and visual-haptic. Audio-visual is the primary multimodality for information gathering. Um, it makes the most sense because hearing and vision are long-distance senses, um, whereas touch, taste, and smell require direct physical contact with the object that we're trying to sense. Visual haptic is sometimes called hand-eye coordination, sometimes called muscle memory, it's our primary multimodality for physical interaction. There's one other, which is audio haptic, and that's for speech production. That allows us to hear what we're saying so that we can speak clearly. Uh, but don't forget how many skin knees it took to learn to ride a bike. We need to train our senses the same way we train our bodies um, to perceive as well as to act. Um, one of the things that we learned while we were writing the book is that there's no such thing as a natural user interface. 
It takes you 18 years to learn how to speak like an adult. It takes you a year and a half to learn how to walk. None of our the skills that are becoming parts of advanced interactions are natural. We acquire them over years of time. So why do we use our senses together? Um, as you're thinking about creating multimodal products, um, it's helpful to think about why our brains combine different kinds of senses together. The first is for context orientation. We use our senses to reinforce each other. So when we hear a sound that corroborates something that we see, um, it helps us um, uh, make sure that what, what we're perceiving is real. Um, it makes it more, uh, and so reinforcing and integrating, sometimes disambiguating. When we hear something that doesn't match up with what we see, we'll, we'll tend to disbelieve the information and try to throw it away or prioritize. If, for example, we see a faint light, but we hear a really loud noise, uh, we try to respond to the sound first. Um, the second is to construct event narratives. This is really important for learning, um, for memory, uh, for creating memories, as well as sometimes triggering the recall of them, um, as well as logic, figuring out uh, why something is happening. We use them together to overcome barriers. This is a really important accessibility strategy. In fact, multimodal is the primary uh, uh, strategy for uh, addressing accessibility issues. We also use it when we need to do specialized activities uh, with, our, uh, with our attention, when we need deep focus um, to concentrate on something that's very complex or broad focus when we're looking at a huge array of information in our environment and trying to figure out what we need to do. And then sometimes they trigger reflex arcs. This is a little bit tricky. This can actually mess up uh, the design of an interface if you trigger accidentally trigger a reflex arc. Um, one of, a good example of this is actually um, the, Nest smoke detector, it actually calmly and quietly tells you to respond to an emergency situation instead of playing this really loud noise that freaks you out and causes you to like freeze. Um, that's actually the smarter way to go. Scaring people in an emergency situation is not a good idea. So multimodal experiences bring different kinds of modes together. <laughs> Um, there are four main categories. The first is parallel modes. You can see that visual, audio, and haptic, for example, these are the primary for uh, computational modes, um, can be used to accomplish the same thing. Um, uh, for example, we can comprehend text through reading, through hearing text spoken, or through braille. Um, integrated modes are used uh, simultaneously to accomplish a single task, like playing video games or watching a film. Asynchronous modes, this is sort of turn-taking between our senses, um, are used together to accomplish a single task, for example, following exercise instructions. That's really good for learning something. We can see it, and then we can try it out for ourselves. And then substitution modes are for accessibility issues. When, for example, one sense is blocked, we can actually uh, move to another um, sensory uh, sense or uh, physical ability. So to go into a, them a little bit, for example, uh, being able to call somebody on the phone, it's actually a repetitive task. Um, being able to have shortcuts for it is really handy. But if you think about it, calling somebody on the phone is a little bit complicated too. You have to think of their number, who you're gonna call, what you're gonna say to them, if their birthday is anytime soon. There's a lot going on in your head. Making it simple to do is actually uh, pretty handy. Integrated modes are really good for learning and for creating logic, um, figuring out uh, why something happened. So for example, when you're learning the alphabet as a child, you sing it. Um, and the rhythm of the song, in fact, helps you keep the 26 letters 
um, in order, and it breaks it apart into chunks so that you can remember it. Um, and then I just really love the movie Memento because you can see how he's using all of these different cues to reconstruct his memory of the past. And multimodal is really great for actually constructing um, uh, that storyline. Substitution modes uh, overcome barriers. So there are a few different kinds of accessibility. There's situational um, accessibility issues. For example, if your arms are full of groceries and you can't grab a doorknob, um, it would be great if it unlocks automatically. There's temporary accessibility issues. For example, if you have an injury or um, and then there's permanent accessibility issues. Uh, and so everybody, everybody experiences accessibility issues at some point in their lives. So it's actually really good to design for accessibility. Uh, you can see in one example, these are all the ways to create text comprehension. And then turn by turn navigation is when you can't uh, look away from the road and it uh, moves over to voice. Um, so what are the core design principles for multimodal? Data is physical. There are new human factors. And focus is the new engagement. Data is physical. It's around a person, and it's about them. So just a quick example. When you have just finished working out at the gym and you want to go home, it's raining. It's Tuesday night. There are a few different ways to get home, right? You could take a taxi. You could walk. You could call an Uber, but it's going to take like five minutes to get there. Uh, maybe you're hungry. You want to get some pizza first. When people are out living their lives, they process a lot of information really fast, and they process a lot of decisions very quickly. At the same time, our devices can figure out things about us that we can't figure out about ourselves. So it's really important to think about um, what is the data a person is experiencing? Is it easier to let them decide for themselves because it's just immediate? Or is it something that's harder for them to understand about themselves? And having a device support them is actually helpful. Uh, there are new human factors to designing for multiple. So when you look at all of the different modes, uh, there are some key attributes. Range is what is the kind of information that can be detected by each mode. Resolution is how much of that particular type of information can that person detect. Focus is how do they prioritize the importance of that information within that sensory modality. Do they have any reflexes around that specific mode? What are the real numbers around accessibility for that mode? That's really important. 64% of everyone in the entire world has some kind of visual impairment. And after the age of 40, people, everyone experiences both visual and auditory loss. Um, and then there are sort of additional facets of each. For example, vision, um, is, vision and hearing are our highest uh, highest resolution senses, even though in terms of range, they're quite narrow. Touch has a wide range, so we can detect lots of things, temperature, pressure, vibration, but not with a high degree of precision or accuracy, um, which is why things like the Taptic Engine um, can create such magical experiences, because we just can't tell. It's easy to trick that sense because it is, it is uh, low fidelity. Um, smell and taste. Uh, again, we were a little bit challenged. We didn't find any computational smell or taste products. But if you find any, let us know. We want to know. So for example, when you think about the visual field, uh, you have blind spots. Your vision is actually black and white on the outer edge, and it curves because of the curvature of your eye. Um, and your nose actually blocks the bottom of your vision. You actually don't see that about your vision. Your brain blocks that out. Your brain compensates for um, 
some of the sort of jagged edges of your sensory ranges. So that's something to think about. We don't perceive the limitations of our own senses. Our brain tries to fill it in for us. Um, and so multimodal is starting to also affect form factors and configurations. Um, this is the, the, the sort of uh, the break. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the word for this kind of a drawing. What? Exploded, Exploded orthogonal. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, so this is for the this is for the ear, uh, ear pod, and you can see that here in the ear, there's this thing called the tragus. It holds the ear pod, uh, the uh, <laughs> ear pod in place. Um, and so there are new ways to design the physical um, attributes of products. So for example, there's physiological, which is to the body. This is all of the wearable experiences. Um, there are more and more of these kinds of products. For example, AR and VR glasses. Um, um, in-ear experiences. Then there's social to the group, which is uh, for an entire room or for a group of people. And then there's spatial that's to the environment. Uh, focus is the new engagement. Attention is managed, not manipulated. So a uh, famous industrial designer, Naota Fukuzawa says, don't design things, design behaviors. And I think we need to update that. Don't design behaviors, design focus. Multimodal design is about balancing attention and agency. Uh, because as you've seen within uh, the modality uh, diagram, there's the sensing and then the, the, there's the acting. So attention is what kind of information are you giving the user to sense and to decide and analyze about? And then in terms of action, what level of control are you giving them? So uh, as you start to think about experiences, where's the attention within that specific mode of the experience? Are you at the right level of detail? Are you giving people a big picture or focusing in on something um, with a high degree of resolution? Or do you need to pull somebody's attention um, to something that they're not seeing for themselves um, and you actually have to uh, move their attention to some place that they don't want it to be? Or are they having trouble focusing or paying attention? Or are they experiencing some kind of accessibility issue and you actually have to compensate for them? These are all new factors for um, designing attention and focus. And finally, uh, when are you designing experiences that don't ha require any attention at all. Uh, the majority of the time, your iPhone is in your pocket or in your purse. Um, how many of you know where your phone is right now? OK. But can you actually, uh, is it, how many of you have it in your pocket? OK. How many of you can actually feel it there now that I've told you that you, it's there? How many of you noticed that it was there before then? No, you kind of ignored it. Your sense of touch sort of tuned it out, right? When do you make experiences forgettable? Um, your brain wants to not notice things most of the time. And so when you think about designing experiences, maybe help, your, help people's brains out and make your experience like not noticeable for like 90% of the time. And that's actually success. That's actually a successful design. So how are multimodal products created? There are new design elements, new kinds of user research. It's much more interdisciplinary. Um, and user testing has to be much more contextualized. So in terms of new design elements, uh, how many of you have heard of affordances? Affordances? Yeah. So Q. So there are a whole bunch more outside of affordances now that we're designing for senses and attention and focus. A cue is sensory information that just tells you about an object. Like, is it heavy? Is it light? Is it ripe? Like, there's specific attributes of, uh, of information around, uh, around an object. 
An affordance tells you that it's something that you can interact with. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Feedback lets you know that something has happened. I'm sure you guys have heard of that one. Feed forward is sort of, it allows you to predict that something is about to happen. This is actually used in traffic lights, and this is important to narrative design. For example, the light turns yellow, and then the rhythm tells you a little bit to know when it's going to turn red. Um, and this is powerful for things like the starts of ra races, like, um, and that sense of rhythm helps people anticipate what will actually happen next. And then um, a prompt is actually specifically for turn taking. It helps people switch between different modes or switch between um, themselves and the device or themselves and another person. Uh, and then there are a bunch of new deliverables. You can use a bunch of existing design deliverables to create multimodal experiences, but there are a couple of new ones that are kind of handy. Uh, there are attention models, modality maps, agency and mode swim lanes, uh, sensory cue blocking, and then per mode design. So an attention model helps you understand, well, what is the flow of information through an experience? Um, and where do people need to be paying attention at different stages of the experience? A uh, modality map takes a closer look at each of the different modes and what is being accomplished within that mode. And then uh, pseudocode and swim lanes help you figure out agency, like who is driving the experience? Is it the person or is it the device? And what is actually happening? And this is similar to creating a conductor score. This is actually trying to look at high level, what are all of the different interface modes doing? What are all of the different sensory modalities doing? Um, and for example, you can design all of the different elements of the experience, but then how do they work together? Uh, so, uh, so as you're designing haptics and ergonomics, basically, uh, you have to think about what is the haptic information? How much information are people deriving from their sense of touch versus um, how much control they're using manually? Uh, for example, when you're using a tool, um, it's a two-way response. Like, for example, when you use a knife to cut sushi, you're, you're feeling the texture of the fish as much as you're actually controlling the knife as it's cutting through things. So you really have to think about um, allowing people to use the tool as it's intended and giving them control, but also giving them um, a sense of feedback on how they're using that tool. Auditory has been expanded uh, to include speech, audio, music, and dialogue. Visual has many different kinds of information that are used in interfaces. And proprioceptive is uh, how people are moving, um, where in a specific world they are, and then embodiment, that sort of full present feeling. Uh, there are about a thousand different ways to make people motion sick with AR and VR. Um, we've just begun to scratch the surface of motion sickness. Um, and then after that, uh, you can go back to designing with the regular sort of deliverables. Um, uh, visual wireframes and visual comps, uh, designing voice experiences using scripts, um, gesture and hapticons. Uh, there are different kinds of documents that you can uh, use for that. And then NUI, ML, machine learning, and AI, that's sort of the more open-ended experiences that are being learned. Uh, that one will take a bit of time uh, to figure out as, as we start to create new ways to interact with our devices and our devices learn to respond to us. That's a bit open-ended still. Uh, the, so there are new kinds of user research around multimodal. It's more observational. It's harder for people to tell you what's going on during multimodal experiences. Um, you can't just survey them. It's longitudinal. 
because people need to often acquire new skills or certain aptitudes for certain kinds of multimodalities need to make themselves visible over time within a, within a cohort, um, you need to actually repeat tests over a period of time to see how people are acquiring specific skills. It's more specialized. Um, increasingly, you're seeing linguistics experts uh, like prosody and uh, opticians and behavioral scientists um, as members of product teams, both on the design and research side. Um, and then there's a spectrum across accessibility. There are actually different levels of accessibility that are addressed uh, with multimodal. Uh, and then there are expanded research tools. So it takes different kinds of equipment to, to test multimodal solutions. Uh, I guess just to finish, multimodal design isn't a skill set. It's not about being able to draw wireframes and also to be able to create scripts for conversational UI. It's a mindset. It's about thinking about how people experience across senses and how to leverage that into a product experience. So I wanted to ask you again, how many of you are multimodal designers? All of you are multimodal designers. <laughs> <laughs>